Welcome to Raising a Catholic Family Today. I'm Ron Flights, the host of this program. With me is our co-host, John Bozio. John's the author of the book, Raising a Catholic Family Today, Building a Domestic Church. John, we're glad to have you today. Thank you, Ron. It's my pleasure to be here. And today we begin a series of six episodes about strengthening the Catholic family, which is the domestic church. In the past few months, John has interviewed families from seven parishes of our diocese. He explored with them the challenges they find and the ways they pass on their faith to their children. You will hear their stories throughout this series. Now, John, what was the purpose of the interviews? Ron, I wanted to learn how families in Middle Tennessee are helping their children grow in their Catholic faith. And in your interviews, what was the first question you asked? The first question was, what are the challenges you encounter in raising a Catholic family today? The responses were many and different. For some parents, the main challenge is the fact that we live in a community where Catholics are a minority. Uh, the challenges that we have in raising a Catholic family really are that there are so many different Christian denominations, and um, our oldest has just now She's seven, and she's been again to start asking, why are they not Catholic? Living where we do, there's barely any Catholic people around. So a lot of the time we have to discuss theological differences with our kids between Catholics and Protestants. That's definitely been a challenge, and, but it also presents an opportunity. I think that's a good point. Living in this part of the country... Um, our kids are exposed to a lot of different faith traditions. And I think one of the challenges is honoring all of those different faith traditions respectfully while also educating our kids on why we are Catholic. For other parents, the challenge is helping their children make sense of the situations they encounter in today's world. I think one of the biggest challenges we face in raising a Catholic family is raising them amidst peers whose parents are raising them with different values and sometimes values that conflict with Catholic teaching and to teach your children Catholic teaching and but then also teaching them to love their peers at the same time. They're exposed to things out of our control in our daughter's preschool who, you know, our daughter's not, our oldest is not even five yet, came home probably about three weeks to a month ago saying, do some kids have two mommies? Being faced at, you know, five years old, the reality of what do you do in this situation when you're invited to a play date at someone's home who has a non-traditional marriage? Still other parents are worried about protecting their children from the values they are exposed to through their electronic devices biggest challenges in raising our Catholic family is monitoring what our kids see, what they hear, what they take in. We're concerned about the video games, cartoons, movies that are directed toward kids, but then they promote violence or revenge or sometimes they even have subtle sexual implications. In my interviews, I also encountered parents who are teaching their children how to live in a secular society without buying into its values. The biggest challenge in raising a Catholic family is probably the same challenge as being a Catholic, just how to navigate living in the world but not being of the world. Yeah, I know that's, that's a challenge today, trying to find your place and your identity as a Catholic family uh, with all the distractions around us. The culture around us is, is relatively hostile to the faith, but we want them to enter that culture not with a fear, but with an excitement to be who they are and to grow in, in not only their own holiness, but to help others encounter Christ as well. As you can hear, the challenges that parents encounter are many, and we are all trying to do our best. Given the challenges described by these parents, in your book, John, where do you suggest that parents start in passing the faith to their children? Ron, that is an important question. I tell parents to start with, with what I consider the two key pillars of raising a Catholic family. The first is the importance of being intentional. 
The second is making room for God in our daily life. So let's start by exploring what it means to be intentional. Grant, what does being intentional mean to you personally? John, to me, it means acting with a purpose in a way that is likely to give the results that is hoped for. Yes, I agree, Ron. Being intentional means acting with a purpose. So I ask families what being intentional in passing on the Catholic faith means for them. Parents describe to me three levels of being intentional. The first level is simply doing what Catholics do. To be intentional in passing the Catholic faith to our kids, there are two really key things to me. One is sending them to Catholic school and surrounding them with Catholic values. Um, Number two is just doing that at home as well. So going to Mass regularly, praying as a family, those type of of things. So like we say, a nightly rosary, we do morning prayers, nighttime prayers. And Mass attendance is a big one. The sacraments, it was very important to us that he did all the sacraments of initiation. We do not miss uh, church on Sundays, no matter what, unless we're dying. They already know that. <laughs> and uh, they have to go dressed up. And so that's a challenge because, especially in the teen, you know, he's like, well, why do I have to dress up? So parents need to help their children form habits of daily prayer and of regular participation in the sacraments. But they also need to explain what we do, and why we do it. That is the second level of intentionality. It was really important to be intentional with them as far as the way that we pray with them. So not just doing it, but also being intentional about why we're doing what we're doing and that they understand what we're doing. And Trying to provide that core value for them and understanding this is why we are and why we choose what we choose. Also to engage our children in a lot of discussion about what's going on around them, that we try to have that discussion about what does this look like in light of our Catholic faith. It's it's very important that we as parents guide them, because if we don't, the world will take over, over them. Finally, the third level of being intentional is modeling a life of faith. In other words, practicing what we preach. To be intentional in passing on the Catholic faith for our children means that we really need to make our faith a priority. I have to be very intentional about modeling a faithful lifestyle uh, to my children uh, so that they can watch the way I live uh, and and see a man that's trying to live out his faith. Obviously, I know that I have many failures in that, and, and that's a struggle on a day-to-day basis, but I... I try to think about how my behavior and how what my children see me doing will affect their faith life down the road. To be intentional is to just practice what we preach. So, whether we are a two-parent family or a single-parent family, we pass on the faith to our children by doing, explaining, and modeling. Of the three, modeling is the most important. This is what Pope Francis told parents. The important thing is to transmit the faith with your life of faith. John, so the first pillar is being intentional. Now remind me again, what's the second? The second pillar in raising a Catholic family is remembering that God is part of our family. Pope Francis expresses this beautiful truth in the joy of love. He writes, The Lord's presence dwells in real and concrete families with all their daily troubles and struggles, joys and hopes. So John, how do we make room for God in our life? Ron, I ask that question to our families. For most families, making room for God in their life means making time to meet with God each day in prayer. Uh, to make room for God in our daily lives by having regular daily prayer uh, with the kids for meals, for bed. Uh, just try to take some time out every day to remember that God is first and to not uh, lose sight of that. We do the rosary together. Um, even if it's just a decade, I feel like our kids are two years old to seven. So, so setting that expectation lower 
where you just continue to pray even if everybody, the toddlers are walking around or we include prayer before meals, prayer at bedtime. We have scripture around the house. Parents also told me that to be successful in finding time to pray, they need to make praying a priority. It is really hard to make room for God in our daily life. Um, it shouldn't be. That's maybe a really terrible thing to say, but it can be really difficult just because of how busy we are. We both work full time and making praying together a priority um, is important. And it's almost like you have to make that the top of your schedule. I think a lot of it too is, is making time, right? I mean, we, we schedule everything else and, and we want to make sure as we're thinking throughout the week or thinking throughout the day that we have time built in for prayer, just like we have time built in for meals or for discussion or for school or anything else. Other families told me that one way to ensure time with God is to start each morning with a prayer. We start every day with prayer, whether it's in the car racing somewhere or sitting down during breakfast and praying. I think first off is starting off with a prayer and having God be the, just like um, rice and, and pray, you know, get down on your knees. It doesn't have to be long. Just... I have that quiet time, prayer time, you know, pretty early in the morning, uh, five o'clock usually. Our son, in fact, wakes up every morning and reads his scripture. Ron, if I could summarize the message of this program, it would be that raising a Catholic family today requires parents to be intentional about remembering that God is present in their home and to teach their children to relate to Him as a member of the family. John, let's now consider the topic of the first chapter of your book, which is Our Home is Our Sanctuary. You write that a sanctuary is a safe place. In building a Catholic home, we want our children to feel welcomed, safe, and cared for. So where do we start? Ron, I believe that the first step is to know if our children feel safe. As parents, we want to be aware of what causes our children to feel anxious. So I asked the parents, what are your children anxious about? Parents told me that what makes their children anxious varies depending on their age. Parents report that their children are anxious about fitting in, not wanting to be left out, doing well in school, being accepted by their peers, finding approval from their teachers. I think it's a funny question because you could always ask, you know, which child on which day, you know, there's so many anxieties uh, that, that come up. We, we see our children struggling with anxieties about school or activities and relationships, uh, which are all a normal part of life. But I think more recently in the past few years, we've noticed our, especially our older children struggling with anxieties about communication, uh, specifically like social media and technology. Point on the eight-year-olds. And I think for them, they're most anxious about loneliness, fitting in, doing things right, um, and not, and not um, upsetting their peers or parental figures or some sort of authority figure. So we talk to some of our grandchildren about what makes them feel anxious. And some of their responses included, I'm worried about making a mistake. I'm afraid of not being good enough or not performing well enough or not making my parents proud. Being aware of our children's feelings becomes more difficult as they get older, but we must make an effort Let's listen to one family's experience. I would say for our teen, for example, um, I think we moved here to Tennessee in January from California, which um, he was very anxious, uh, you know, with so much lockdown, the fact that they, they took away everything from them and they just went home and they had no communication pretty much besides social media, right? But he couldn't meet with his friends, go out, do anything. At first it was something new, so it was fun. But then later on, it became like uh, depressing and almost suicidal. And uh, and uh, and we learned that from our from friends of his friends. So it, it was a shocker, uh, and I think it's something that uh, his parents we were shocked. I mean, he seemed like a like he was okay, but that we need to pay more attention. 
This adolescent had suicidal thoughts, and the parents learned about it only from his friends. In the U.S., suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people aged 15 to 24, according to the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And that's astounding. In your book, you mention that children feel anxious when they are exposed to conflicts between their parents. Can you expand on that, John? Yes, I will. That is a good point. But the parents, united as a couple, are the source of stability in the home. When the children see or hear their parents fight and argue, they feel anxious because they fear that the stability of their home is threatened. Having said that, let me add that conflicts in a marriage are inevitable and perhaps necessary for the couple to grow. But I would say that when our children are exposed to conflicts, they need to also see that their parents are reaching a peaceful resolution and stability is returned. I ask parents, have you noticed how your children react when they are exposed to conflicts between the two of you? Yeah, I think that conflict in front of children do make them very anxious and worried. But if they're able to see that you've resolved it in front of them, if you're going to have a disagreement in front of them, it kind of brings that anxiety or that worry to a rest. They know when there's tension in the house. They know when there's tension between us. Um, yeah, our big kids will tend to back off, yeah. get quiet, try to be a little less needy for a little while and give us some space. But, but that's the older children yeah. because I would say our youngest, um, he, again, is very sensitive to when there's tension and tries to distract us with, like, happy thoughts. There's a conflict between the two of us. Usually a child reacts by wanting to be a peacemaker. Parents also said that while they are shielding their children from major conflicts, when minor disagreements happen, they hope to be able to model for them how to resolve their differences. We try not to fight in front of our kids, um, but we do not mind arguing in front of our kids because I think it is really important for our kids to see that two people who love each other can argue and then resolve that argument and it can and then it can end and it doesn't have to go on and it can be peaceful and it can be over is a good opportunity as well to show them how you deal with conflict so it's not that we'll never have conflict so hiding it and being in the back room having that conflict is not necessarily a healthy thing to do as well so having that conflict engaging in it and then showing them the resolution for it as well they stand back and they pay attention. Uh, we can tell that they're looking at us as we're working through things. And uh, I think they're learning. And uh, that's really that's really why we don't go behind closed doors with our conflicts, because it's a teaching moment. So I also asked parents to share some of the conflict resolution skills that they find most helpful. So I would say for us, just really talking it out is really important. Uh, so I think both of us just try to take a step back and really take a posture of listening. Yeah. And validation versus agreement. So sometimes if I'm upset about something like, I feel like you never do the additions. It's so helpful if Paul will say, I hear you and I'm sorry that you feel that way. That doesn't mean that he agrees that he's that I'm always doing the dishes, but just a validation of the other person's feelings, because it's easier to come to a compromise if you don't feel like you're attacked, if you feel heard when you're upset about something. In reading your book, John, I noticed that in Chapter 1, you've included pointers on conflict resolution learned from Dr. John Gottman, a psychologist who researched the behaviors of married couples for over 40 years. These pointers sure can be very helpful. Ron, I agree. In my book, I also encourage spouses who do not seem to be able to solve conflicts on their own to get some professional help. Sometimes it helps to have a professional mediate some of our differences. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think about the Hurstful disagreements too. What that's been helpful for us is um, we actually attend counseling together since our daughter passed away. And so that's actually a place we've been able to have some disagreements and kind of talk through them. And you kind of have that, that third party counselor who can, you know, um, unpack it for you and be more objective. And I think that's helped us 
you know, outside of counseling, how to have healthy disagreement and when things are hurtful, how to, how to reconcile. So when conflicts happen in your family, make sure that the children see you reconcile. And if the conflicts persist, then seek professional help. John, what else can parents do to make their homes safe for their children? Ron, there is another aspect of home safety that parents need to be aware of. It is to guard against intruders. This is especially true today with regard to the use of cell phones, internet, social media, and video games. Pope Francis commented, parents need to be concerned about who is providing their children's entertainment and who is entering their rooms through television and electronic devices. So I asked parents, what rules do you have for your children's use of media? I heard many wonderful ideas about managing the electronic devices, when and where they are to be used, and accountability in using them. Let's listen. We're pretty strict on media usage in our family. I, I'd say social media, for one, uh, we're in the tiny minority of people, um, and we've not allowed any of our teenage children to have any social media accounts at all. Uh, that's been hard, uh, especially on our teenage boys, and, and it's been frustrating. Uh, but we really feel like that has been an extremely liberating lifestyle for us to be free from social media. And we, even though it's hard for our children, we, we want to protect them from that. Um, in addition, in addition to limiting social media, um, phones and computers in our house, we have a, we have a piece of furniture, a piece called the arsenal, which is where everything charges. And so phones don't go in your rooms, computers don't go in your rooms, they're all used in public spaces, and when you're not using them for their purpose, they, they need to go back in the arsenal and remain charged there. So, And we also have a designated, like, no phone by a certain time each day. So that way, we know that they're not, you know, when we say, hey, good night, and they go to bed, they're not on their technology at midnight or one o'clock in the morning. When it comes to using media in our home, the rules are that it needs to be used in a public place. So it needs to be used in like a living room or some area where people are walking back and forth, which kind of takes away some temptation. I think a lot of the consumption of media today is done through technology, you know, through phones and computers. And so, you know, make sure that uh, they have the appropriate technology for their age. So. We're not big fans of cell phones when the kids are young. They don't need it. Our kids don't have a cell phone until there's a reason to, which is usually when they're much older and working outside the home. Um, and then even then we have accountable to you other things to help them consume that media well. Um, and this is not really, you know, about, it's not so much about limiting as it is directing and making sure that what they're consuming is actually edifying. We have to be able to access it. So if they pa if they have it password protected, we know the passwords. We should be able to look at their history, their pictures, their text messages. Like there's there's no secret. We have accountable to you on all of our, you know, phones, computers, and that kind of thing as well. So they're fully aware that anything they do on it, we can see everything, regardless if they save it on their history or not. John, as we conclude, let me summarize what we talked about in this episode. Whether you are a two-parent or a single-parent family, raising your children to be Catholics requires intentionality. And John, in your book, you compare family life to a voyage with a canoe and river fraught with many competing currents. Being a canoeist, I understand that. You can wind up going any which way. Parents need to intentionally navigate the waters of today's cultural river to make it safely to their destination. And also, being intentional is not quite enough. To succeed on this voyage, parents need to recognize that Jesus is in their family's canoe with them, and they must listen to him. In closing, we ask everyone to make an effort to be aware of how your children feel, what they are anxious about. And in addition, I invite you to 
A. Agree with your spouse on how you want to handle your disagreements, especially when the children are present. And B. Review your family's rules about the use of cell phones, TV, internet, and social media. We want to close with words of appreciation to the 12 families that share their experiences with us during this series. They are Sam and Courtney Bolton of St. Francis Cabrini, Chris and Rebecca Zarka of St. Anne, Jackie and Gustavo Gasca of St. Stephen, Ryan and Rebecca Hanning of St. Lawrence, Graham and Heather Honeycutt of St. Matthew, also of St. Matthew, Matt and Fran Yeager, Andrew and Joanna Janfro of Holy Rosary, Robin and Cindy Roberts of Mother Teresa, Chris and Audrey Russell of St. Stephen, also from St. Stephen, Brian and Stephanie Smith, Brian and Katie Stockwell of Holy Rosary, and Paul and Amy Welsh of St. Stephen. And I thank you for spending this time with us. Join us for our next episode, Home is a Place Where Love Resides.